Good morning. Oh, let's try one more time. Good morning. <laughs> Would you do me a favor and just welcome anyone who might be new here today or watching online today? Can we just tell them we're glad they're joining us? Yeah. So glad that you're here. I, I was asked this last week if we had anything fun for kids planned this week. If you weren't here yesterday, it was something to see. Just a multitude of children and thankfully parents that accompanied them. One parent came up to me and said, I see what you're doing here. I said, really? They said, yeah, you, you give our kids all kinds of chocolate and sweets and then you send them home. I said, that is our strategy <laughs> right there. That's a thrill that you're with us uh, today. And obviously we want to talk about the most significant event, not just in Christian history, but in human history. We're in Mark's gospel, we're in chapter 16. It says, when the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome brought spices so that they may go anoint Jesus' body. Very early on the first day of the week, just after sunrise, they were on their way to the tomb and they asked each other, who will roll the stone away from the entrance of the tomb? But when they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had been rolled away. And as they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. Don't be alarmed, he said. You are looking for Jesus, the Nazarene, who was crucified. He is risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. But go tell his disciples and Peter, he is going ahead of you into Galilee. And there you will see him just as he told you. Trembling and bewildered, the women went out and fled from the tomb. They said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. What we're celebrating today is something so astonishing that it has captured the imaginations of generations in every demographic you can possibly imagine. We know death is inevitable. We may not know how we will die or where we will die or when we will die. We just know that we will die. We've all been introduced to death in kind of a painful way, either by attending the funeral services of people that we love or look up to. That's why this passage from scripture is so critically important for us today. On the very first Easter morning, there were three women and they were headed to the tomb of Jesus and they were not looking for a resurrected Jesus. They were actually looking to embalm the body of Jesus. That's why they brought the spices that they did. They knew that there was a problem that they did not have a solution to. There was a large stone that had been rolled a lot of men were responsible for putting it there. It had been rolled into the entrance of the tomb and they knew they were not sufficient in order to move that stone. So they're asking themselves, who could we get to roll the stone away from the tomb? And when they arrived at the tomb, they were surprised because the stone was already moved. And when they walked right into the cave, they saw a young man. And I love this about the information. They didn't stumble into a wrong uh, cave. They didn't stumble into the wrong graveside. This young man is very clear. He's an angel sent from God and he says, Jesus, the Nazarene who was crucified, no case of mistaken identity here, he is risen and he has gone on ahead of you to Galilee. Go tell Peter and the disciples this news. What's interesting to me is that when these women hear this news, there's no high fives, there's no singing, there's no dancing, there's no celebrating. There's two words that describe their exit from the tomb. One is trembling. They're in shock. They don't have anything in their experience that would help them get past what they were eyewitnesses to in the crucifixion of Jesus and they're bewildered, they're confused. None of this is making any sense. Which brings me to my first point, and I think this is true. No one likes surprises. Oh, we think we do, but only certain kinds of surprises. And even then we like a heads up. 
Has anybody ever gone to a party where you were supposed to be surprised, but you figured it out before you got there? Did anybody act surprised? Did you pull it off? Yeah, some of us can, some of us can't. We think we want to be surprised that we don't. We're far more comfortable with the familiar, even if it's painful, than we are with the unknown or the uncertain or the unpredictable. And this is our primary problem that we have with God. We would prefer a God who's predictable. We would prefer a God who's like a domesticated pet. It comes when you call him and goes when you command him. That's not the God of the Bible. If you're looking for a tame God, you better stay out of graveyards because God does some very unpredictable things. Now, nearly every person who's in this room and who's watching online has heard some version of the Easter story, of the resurrection of Christ. And in that sense, part of my concern is we're a little too familiar with the story. I wish I got to be the first person to tell you. I think that would be really cool. This is not just a Jesus who resuscitated after having gone through a physical trial and he's recovered and, and he's apologetic about being late to the party or about what he put people through. This is a resurrected Jesus who's actually gone on ahead of them to Galilee. Some people talk about Jesus the way they talk about deceased family members that awake all kind and sweet words and gentle memories. I've heard that people have trouble accepting death. That's nothing in comparison to accepting resurrection. It would be easier to believe in a Jesus who stayed dead. It would not have made his sacrifice any less and it would not have diminished his love for us. We are more comfortable with a hero that dies for us than we are with a savior who comes back from the dead to rescue us. We would rather embalm Jesus than dare to hope that there is something greater than death. That stone is just too big for us to roll away. Maybe it's why so many religious gatherings look more like memorial services than victory celebrations. If you ever heard people talk in churches, remember the time when Jesus did that? Remember what he said? You can almost hear, oh, how I miss him. Grief can make a more comfortable companion than faith. We would rather be inspired by the stories of Jesus and try to improve ourselves than to believe in a Jesus who treats tombs like Airbnbs, not a, not a permanent residence, but an overnight accommodation. The stone is just too big for us to roll away. In a lot of ways, we live our lives in a garden of graves. We're filled, our lives are filled with many funerals and lots of cemeteries, places where we have pronounced the death of something, maybe our dreams of what we hoped we could become, or maybe some friendships that were broken over some kind of misunderstanding, or marriages that that died either from neglect or from betrayal, or our futures ruined by the disappointments that we've had to endure, the losses that we've had to endure. And people will tell you, you have to learn to let go. And that's true, but it's not the same thing as learning to move on. But it's all we know. We're more comfortable with accepting the death of those things then we are wondering what a resurrected Jesus might do with those things. The stone is just too big for us to roll away. Death provides endings to the stories, nice little life accounts that we can carry around like books that we can refer to and quote from. It's got a table of contents and a number of pages that tells us how long we will be here. We don't know what to make if our entire life is just an introduction into an eternal one? How am I supposed to live and how am I supposed to love if graves are not the final resting place? The stone is too big for us to roll away. 
And the tombs where we have buried our hopes and dreams and friendships and marriages and loves are nothing compared to the tombs we bury ourselves in. Somebody in our life pronounced something to us that made us feel unwanted and unloved and unimportant, and we accepted it. It was a kind of death certificate that identified the time of death and the cause of death. And we needed no pallbearers for that funeral. We walked ourselves into that tomb. If you think the stone is too big to roll away from the outside, you should try rolling one from the inside. It's just too big big for us to roll away. Don't get me wrong. Some of us have made serious efforts to try to roll those stones. We have the blisters and the bruises to prove it. But the question I have is, is it possible that you are trying to do what only God can do? Are you trying to do what only God can can do. Maybe you are telling yourself inside of your tomb that I wish I had met Jesus when that part of my life was still alive and things could be so much different. The resurrected Jesus tells you today things can still be so much different. That's a really good place for an amen. Yeah. Stone was too heavy for three women to move. The very thing that stood between them and the beginning of their faith was too much, too heavy, too large to move. It's not just true of them, it's true of us. Sometimes we assume if we can perform a kind of mental gymnastics or concentrate long enough on something that we'll be able to come to a place of faith in the risen Christ. Our knowledge is limited. Our strength is limited. Our endurance is limited. But God is not limited. Maybe there are some things that God has done that have begun to roll the stone for you. See, God loves to roll away the stone of doubt. I know there are people who actually believe that the story of the resurrection of Jesus was kind of manufactured many years after the life of Jesus. It was created and it was embellished and, and, and it kind of brought early believers together. But if the leaders of the church were going to make up a story of a resurrection, they would have made themselves look a lot better than the actual story does. They come off as weak, afraid, in a lot of ways pathetic. And by the way, they also allowed the very first witnesses of the res resurrection to be women. And in the ancient world, women were not given a voice and they were not considered credible witnesses. Aren't you glad we live now when women are always believed? <laughs> oh. Hmm. All of the disciples, all of them struggled with doubt. One of them even went so far as to say this, I will not believe in the resurrected Jesus unless I can take my fingers and put them into the wounds that I saw him receive during crucifixion. Later in Mark 16, Jesus actually rebukes the 11 for their lack of faith when they heard the good news. Stone of doubt is too large for us to roll, but maybe God can help us today. God also loves to roll away the stone of unworthiness. Peter had denied Jesus three times at the trial of Jesus. He's in the courtyard, he's watching this occur. Scripture records that every time Peter denied Jesus, he actually got a little further away from him. Jesus had warned him and foretold him that this was going to happen. But he said, when this happens, I'm actually praying for you that your faith will not fail. It's amazing how often we assume that if we have failed, our faith did too. Peter believed in a resurrected Jesus. He didn't think that he could be resurrected into ministry. His days as a useful voice in the company of Jesus were over. And then there was this breakfast meeting with Jesus on a beach. And Jesus moved the stone of unworthiness for Peter. He said, if you love me, feed my sheep. The question I have for you is, when are you going to start believing what God says about you more than the other voices in your life? Will you let him move the stone of unworthiness because they and you are not able? And then God loves to roll away the, st the stone of fear. 
There were a lot of eyewitnesses of Jesus' resurrection, over 500 at one time. And what you should know is they were not celebrated for that. People did not gather them around and have them repeat their story and over and over. In fact, they weren't even just mocked for telling the story. They were often murdered for sharing it. They were tortured. They were fed to wild animals. They were actually burned alive. After the crucifixion of Jesus, they were all looking for places to hide. But after the resurrection of Jesus, they were all looking for places to preach. <laughs> what changed? Somebody moved the stone. A fear they were no longer afraid of death. Their courage actually inspired others to dare to believe that God was active and present in their lives. A man who would become the Apostle Paul was previously known as Saul of Tarsus. He stood by and watched a young man whose life was being taken from him. He was being stoned to death. And he saw such courage and he saw such faith, he couldn't shake it. It was the beginning of his journey of faith. That was when the stone for Paul began to move. God was at work in his life. And here's what you need to know about God and moving stones is God doesn't roll away stones just to prove a point. That's what our culture does. We're constantly trying to prove we're right. God doesn't roll away the stone to prove a point. He rolls it to share life with us. It takes quite a bit of force to move a stone from in front of a tomb, but that's nothing compared to the power it takes to bring life out of death. We're seeing a display of military power in places in our world, bombs, missiles, tanks, bullets, power that has the capacity to destroy buildings and take life. And there's even a threat of increased power because there are such things as nuclear weapons, unbelievable power, capable of taking unbelievable number of lives, none of it enough to restore life. You can harness all the electrical power that humans can possibly generate and add to it all the volts of every lightning bolt that has ever fell off and fallen from the sky. And you can add to that every atomic bomb and every nuclear device that's ever been created. And you have enough power to take a lot of lives, maybe all the lives, but you don't have enough power to raise a single life. That's the kind of power that Jesus has. He raises, he brings life out of death. God doesn't just move stones. He brings life out of death. Now, belief in the resurrection of Jesus, I have to just let you know this on the front end, doesn't exempt you from difficult and painful things in life. This is not a protection game. Be a follower of Jesus, give a certain amount of money, and we'll make sure you and yours are okay. That's not how Christianity works. People have paid a great price for their faith, Gospel is not a protection racket. You may hear some unnerving news in your life. I have. You may have to go through some painful trials. You may have to face some things that you would rather run away from. But the good news is, is we don't just have a memory and a memorial service of a Savior. We have one who's present with us in the midst of it all. And he gives unbelievable peace that invades our anxious thoughts. And even when everything around us is in tumult, we can find ourselves experiencing confidence. He can give courage to engage and take on things that are challenging and beyond our ability and maybe even things that we think are impossible. He gives strength to continue difficult assignments and tasks. He gives hope in the face of unbelievable darkness. He gives wisdom for complicated problems and challenges. He gives joy, not just in at the end of sorrow, but right in the middle of it. Our world keeps telling us you can't be happy and go through sorrow at the same time. And, and the, the risen Savior says he can bring joy into the midst of your suffering. How many of it would be okay with you if God brought a little joy into your life regardless of what else you're going through? Yeah? It's possible. I'll ask the worship team to come back. It's possible that God has moved enough stones for you to be able to trust him for your future. Maybe that's happening for you right now. I'm not here to tell you that if you put your faith in Jesus, you'll always get raises. The square footage of your house will automatically increase. Your children will become straight-A students. 
your spouse will not only become more faithful, but even more beautiful. That on Easter Sunday morning, it will not snow on your house. <laughs> That's not what I'm saying. We live in a broken world. It's filled with very real problems. It's not an illusion, despite what some people say. In the midst of all of that, we're constantly confronted with stones that are too much for us to move. It's too heavy, it's too hard. We don't have enough help, we don't have enough strength, we don't have enough time. And like three women, we find ourselves wondering, how is this ever going to change? Who's ever going to move this stone? And what you need to know is God is already ahead of you. This Jesus, the Nazarene, who was crucified, is risen. And he's already ahead of you. He's got good things for your life. He's got strength that he wants to share with you. He's got wisdom he wants to impart to you. He's got options and opportunities that he wants to open for you. And whether you're on the inside of a tomb trying to get out or on the outside of a tomb wishing you could recover things that you've lost, what you need to know is there is one who is powerful enough not only to roll away stones, but to give brand new life to each and every one of us. So I'm going to ask you to bow your heads this morning. I'm not going to ask you if you've got everything figured out. I'm not going to ask you how strong you feel, how happy you are. I'm going to ask you, do you think it's possible that God has moved a stone enough for you today to begin a journey of faith? I don't know where the resurrected Jesus will lead you, but I know he wants to meet you right now. So I'm going to ask if you're here this morning and you want to start this journey, begin this journey with the resurrected Jesus. You don't want it just to be a fable that you hope is true or a faith that you've heard about. You want to see the stone in your life rolled away and you want to walk with and fellowship with the resurrected Jesus. Now, I, I just want to tell you, when you make this decision, you might not automatically feel all celebratory. You might not be high-fiving. You might not be dancing in your place. You, you might not be singing super loud. You might be a lot like these three women who when they walked away, they were trembling and they were bewildered. But I've got really good news for you on that. We all started out trembling and bewildered and every step increases our capacity to trust God even more in our lives. So if you're here this morning, if you're here this morning and you wanna begin that journey today, I'm just gonna ask you to lift a hand up and just hold it up until I acknowledge you. I won't do anything to embarrass you. That's not how we roll around here. But I do want to pray when we come to the end of this service today. That stone not only will have been moved, but you'll have been introduced to a resurrected Jesus. Anywhere in this room today, you'd like to begin that journey today, just lift a hand up and hold it up until I call on you. Thank you, I see that hand. Anyone else? Just lift it up, hold it up. See that hand, thank you very much. I'll give you a minute. I see that hand, thank you. Anyone else? I see that hand, thank you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, there are things that are too big, too hard, and too heavy for us. None of them are those things for you. For those who raised their hands this morning, would you begin to roll the stones, whether it's fear or unworthiness or doubt or any other name, any other stone that has been placed in front of them, would you begin to roll that away so the journey of their faith can begin? Because this same Jesus, the Nazarene, who was crucified, is risen, and he's with us today. In Jesus' name, 
Amen. Let's all stand together this morning.